I think I want to start this in with kind of a broad question. So the work that you guys all do has a lot to do with preparing cities for the future. I'm wondering if you could each tell me what you think, if you had to pick one thing, what is the biggest challenge facing cities as they try to modernize? Gary, I want to start with you. Yeah, so, so I know a lot of the, uh, the folks in the, the audience are focusing on, on smaller cities. We've been looking at things a little bit broader, so looking across the transportation system. And when we think about that transportation system, we think about it just fundamentally as, as broken. And really, it's the dollars that are spent into it. So the biggest problem is the dollars. There's $3, th $3 trillion that are spent on the transportation system inside of uh, the U.S. today. And probably more than importantly than that, there's 40,000 accidents, the highest in the decade that has happened during this last year. And the vehicles are utilized 4% of the time on average, a little bit more certainly during, during rush hour. So when we think about the opportunity, the biggest thing, it is those, those dollars. And if there can be a 20% gain in transportation efficiency, it's $3,000 for every household in the U.S. And when we think about that, that is one of the largest transformations of, of wealth moved from uh, kind of from the, an inefficient system into the, the people's pockets. That, that's the, really the problem that we're looking to, to focus on, and I think the cities play a, a key role in making it happen. Carrie Ann. Sure, so a slight bit of context. Um, we work, uh, Open Data Nation works in 26 cities around the United States to support Vision Zero efforts. So we all know last year about 40,000 people in the United States died on our roads uh, as a result of traffic crashes, the most since 2007, and the equivalent of about 211 Boeing 727s falling out of the sky every single year and killing everyone on board. It's a really big problem, um, and we have a pretty elegant solution to resolve it. When we work with 26 cities, we talk to them about where they're at today, and kind of the journey to getting to where they are at today and where they need to be tomorrow. Uh, we recently published a paper in partnership with Microsoft called the Smart City Evolution. It's no longer a revolution. It's not a revolutionary act to think about uh, using some of the data coming out of cities. It's administrative data from police crash reports or fire and emergency response to thinking about some of the IoT sensor device data um, and soon to be data coming off of autonomous and connected vehicles. So the greatest challenge, I think, is really transitioning from a time where we use data to be very descriptive. Where was the problem yesterday? How many people died last year? Instead of perhaps applying a little bit more advanced math, you know, everyone here may have taken statistics in high school and we get a little nervous and uncomfortable when I say the word statistics, but applying predictive statistics, applying machine learning to think about getting ahead of problems, prioritizing public dollars and public resources to prevent crashes and save lives before they happen. Eric? Yeah, so um, for some context, uh, SPIN is, uh, if you've seen these orange bikes around uh, DC, that's, uh, that's our bikes. And uh, really, we started this company out of San Francisco to tackle one of the biggest challenges that we see in cities in the US, which is moving away from this car-centric culture into a more multimodal um, form of uh, transportation networks that, that cities really should be, taking into account uh, public transit, personal transit, and uh, active transportation. So. Uh, what we see in DC is just one of our uh, 21 locations around the, the country. And I think w really what we're trying to do is accelerate that change, move away from cars, re reduce congestion around uh, the country. And I think that's one, that's, that's one of the major uh, problems that, that cities are facing uh, in the US and even around the world. Derek and Gary. Carrie Ann talked a little bit about using data and taking it to move the conversation forward, to predict a little bit how to make cities better, how to move people forward. How are you guys thinking about predictive analytics in the work that you do? Yeah, I guess already from, a, from its outset, it, it is a data analytics company. So we've been taking driving data since 2010 from probably two and a half to three million vehicles, and also from handsets and collecting this driving data. So we've collected 29 billion miles of driving data and have all the associated claims data that goes along with it. So we have very accurate, very predictive models today that if I see how you are driving, I'm going to know the safer drivers from the non-safe drivers. A lot of that came from the, the insurance business on how to more accurately price people from an insurance standpoint, but we found it is just as applicable in the shared mobility world. So for my, the, the Lyft um, uh, gentleman that was in the prior panel, I want my Lyft driver to have four stars because he indeed is a good driver, and not just that his car didn't smell and he gave me a mint. And I know there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of the consumer aspect of things that I want him to give me that mint and that bottle of water, and it really is important 
but, uh, but ultimately I want to understand the safety. The other thing we do, because we grew out of the Allstate Corporation, we have access to all the kind of the crash data claims data from one-tenth of the U.S. population over the last 85 years. So we have a really good insight into the most, um, the most dangerous intersections, the most dangerous road types, and we start to blend that together back to the, the analytics. Now I blend that together with actual real driving data, and I blend it together with time of day and with weather and everything else. So now that I know that your particular driving behavior moving down this road at sunset in this type of a vehicle means something even more. So it's, uh, it, it's really an exciting time as we start thinking about how, um, I guess, moving towards autonomous. We'll probably talk about that later. But even just in today's paradigm, there's a lot that we can do to try to make the, the system safer and more efficient. Yeah. Derek, how are you guys thinking about predictive analytics? Well, I think let's talk about data more in a broader sense. So um, what we have done um, as when we first created the, the first stationless bike share permit along with Seattle in, uh, back in July, we wanted to make sure that data, was a, data, data sharing was a big part of the permit because we felt that it's extremely important for cities to have access to the data that we have. Like we have GPSs on our bikes, so they have high resolution data that... Um, uh, that they previously never had access to. Uh, so one of the things that, that we want them to use the data is to inform urban planning and to as well like use it to support the, the, the massive number of projects that they, they have in, in their works. Um, a second aspect of data I think that we should all probably address on this panel as well is on the, the aspect of data privacy. I think data privacy is extremely important as a lot of data gets stored in the cloud and we need to be very aware as, as where this data is uh, being sent to, how is it protected, is it kept within U.S. borders, things like that. I think all this, uh, as much more pers very personal transportation data gets out in, uh, to, in the hands of uh, many different people, we should be very aware of it, and that's one of the things that we uh, focus on when we, are, when we talk to cities about uh, sharing data. Mm -hmm. Karen, how do you think about that, the need to balance the safety and privacy of people's data and the need to use more data? Great, so we are definitely huge advocates of thinking proactively about privacy, but I will say from my standpoint as a company, Open Data Nation uses a lot of open data, and there are billions of records of data that don't have these privacy concerns attached to them that are going underutilized. So the way we think about leveraging those data that we're already paying for, that are already published, but nobody really looks at, is threefold. Uh, I'm an MIT city planner, so I appreciate that you are uh, calling out the city planners among us. Um, but the three ways we hear from other city planners that they want to use it is to evaluate, to plan, and to prioritize. So when we do a vision zero intervention, say we do some road re-engineering, education or enforcement activities, how do we know it worked? We can use statistics to isolate the effects of what you did and determine how many crashes it prevented, how many lives you saved. Uh, to plan, so to consider alternative scenario planning or against the status quo, and to prioritize. Uh, for those of you who work in departments of transportation, you get the old guy calling because, you know, he walks his dog and the crosswalk on his street isn't repainted. Well, how do we tell him, look, according to the city's priorities for health and safety, we're going to put you 50th on the list and expect to respond to your issue in six months because we want to paint the crosswalk on Minnesota Avenue where a lot of people cross a four-lane highway. So I think those three ways we need to attack not only just the concept of data and the concept of complicated statistics, but really tie it back to the business intelligence that enables agencies to make really powerful decisions. I want to hook this back into the conversation we've been having all day, which is the talk about infrastructure and the need to both maintain it and to upgrade it so that it can actually work with some of the smarter technologies um, that we're trying to deploy in cities. I'm wondering how you guys think about the needs for better infrastructure and also how you think about the need for private companies, private entities to work with cities and state governments to upgrade infrastructure in a way that's helpful here. Yeah, so, so I'm going to go back uh, maybe a ways. So I hope it's gotten a lot better, but I started my career in the, uh, the early 90s as a traffic engineer, as a bridge designer, uh, a civil engineer, and at the time doing traffic management inside of the city. If there was an accident that happened on any given road, we had to know that you had to call the city police, the county highway patrol, or the state police. And just that, that intersection between those different jurisdictions to try to make things happen. So when I think about today, and I, like I say, I really hope that it had gotten a lot better, 
but we start talking about the interconnectivity technically of these different cities with uh, the work that Carrie Ann was talking about, the prioritization of the county system being different than the city system, I just find it completely daunting to think of how do we, how do we make that work in a, in a robust way. And I think maybe um, seminars like this where you start to see those bigger issues that comes into play. So in a lot of ways, I, I kind of go back to, to the vehicles themselves and to people making choices and the work that, that GM is doing, the work that, um, that the shared mobility companies are doing to try to make the system more efficient without going so crazy into the infrastructure. It needs to be done and the, bridge, the roads need to be safe, but it just feels like it's a, long, it's a long, hard road and we need to get much better at coordination. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And there's shared interests. You and I both work in the insurance space. And when I say 40,000 traffic deaths, guess who paid out for those claims, right? So the insurance industry had the worst year last year for commercial auto fleets. Um, they're looking for solutions that are gonna lower traffic crashes and improve safety on roads because it matters to their bottom line. So I think when cities think about interventions, there is alignment on public safety, public health in particular, um, and it is really reaching out to and understanding that alignment, bit, particularly between insurance and, and cities. Here, how do you think about this? Yeah, I think what's interesting for us is that in, um, infrastructure directly impacts our, our business, um, mm -hmm. especially since we are essentially taking a more niche form of transportation and trying to proliferate it around the country, that being biking. Um, as everyone probably realizes, biking probably consists about 4% of all commute trips uh, uh, around, uh, around the, the country, and part and parcel of that is due to the lack of infrastructure. So the way we view our role in the whole, in the whole system is to provide more bikes to people to ultimately encourage cities to build even more infrastructure, because once you create a virtuous cycle of actually having the right infrastructure to encourage uh, multimodal transport, especially the active transportation aspect of it, um, it will help benefit the cities on, on, on multiple levels. So one of the things that I cover a lot is issues of equity in cities. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk a little bit about this because when bike share was introduced to a lot of cities, it was criticized as something that people could only use if they obviously had debit cards, if they were wealthier, things of that nature. And when we talk about cars, it's somewhat of the same issue. A lot of people do not have the money to afford a car, car payments, insurance, things of that nature. So when we talk about ensuring equity in a city and the ability to use all of these awesome new technologies that we're talking about when we talk about the ability to use dockless bike share, how are you guys thinking about ensuring that everyone is reached? Yeah, to, to, to me, it's the, it's the most exciting time. It's kind of how I started this, this presentation of getting to that extra $3,000 in the pocket of every family mm -hmm. that can go to these forms of transportation. It used to be either you had a car or you took transit. There weren't really all of these, these options, but the cool thing about our, um, the American ingenuity, or it's, it's not, it's a global phenomenon as well, but the idea that there are new solutions coming, coming into the market. So we don't think that the whole world will go to ride sharing or the whole world will go to car sharing. It's going to be a blend. So somebody that, that maybe doesn't want to afford the car, they can use it periodically as they need to have it. I'm a, a big bike user in, in uh, downtown Chicago where I spend a good chunk of my time and the ability to use bike part of the time, then the car that's sitting in the garage, I can use as a sharing component that I could receive some income in. So I, I think it's a, actually a great unifier and creates more availability and doesn't hinder it. So from when we started this company, I think one of the key values we wanted to really focus on is uh, equity. Uh, a lot of young transportation companies really don't focus on that until really later in their life. And, and we look at equity from a, a few perspectives. I don't, by no means is it perfect, but first of all, it's geographic equity. By virtue of our system, we are able to deploy in neighborhoods which were potentially historically uh, transportation deserts. Uh, another thing that we focus on is a program which allows the unbanked and people who do not have smartphones to be able to use our bikes. Um, and we are trialing this program where they would um, uh, essentially go buy kind of a, a, a cash-based card and be able to use their normal non-smartphone to, to unlock our bikes. And what we also do use as well is we honor like kind of the, um, the reduced fare income qualified uh, transit programs. Um, so most of them get 50% off. We also do the same by extending the same level of discount to, uh, to uh, low, lower income communities. And we are able to subsidize it from basically our normal fares that normal people, would, 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 uh, our normal riders would normally pay at a normal rate. So, so this is our way of kind of like working on 
uh, the equity component, both from a geographic and kind of a cost accessibility standpoint. So one of the really encouraging things I learned as part of my journey working with 26 cities in the United States, Anchorage, Alaska to Miami, Florida, in writing the Smart City Evolution, we did not include the word equity in the first draft. And I can't tell you, five, six, seven different departments of transportation insisted that it make it in the second draft. So it is a very encouraging thing that departments of transportation are thoughtful about equity. Here in the district, uh, they do not shy away from reporting that black and brown people are seven times more likely than everybody else to be hit and killed by a vehicle. And so when we think about strategies, we first need to acknowledge that the problem does disproportionately affect specific communities. Um, and I think at an encouraging note, at least here in the District of Columbia, they are being very thoughtful um, in their approach. I think as we think about transportation, especially vehicles moving forward, we would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about autonomous and self-driving technology. I'm wondering, Carrie Ann and Gary, how you guys are thinking about the future of your work um, when we have a lot of people saying that within the next few years, within the next decade, certainly, um, the driving landscape will look a whole lot different. Yeah, I'll jump in on that to say, um, we worked with the city of Fort Lauderdale, and I have a fun anecdote. They recently had a hurricane, um, and so we're talking to them about the, the issues that result from disasters and emergencies, and they said, if we had autonomous vehicles on the road, we'd be in really big trouble, because guess what? All of the stop signs got ripped up in the hurricane. Pretty simple issue, but we don't think about how um, the technologies that we're developing in autonomous vehicles need to interface and have conversations with the urban landscape. Um, there are very technical solutions and sensors that are getting more sensitive to seeing the stop sign, but guess what? If someone's standing in front of it or a hurricane rips it up, it can't see what it can't see or what isn't there. And so our approach has actually been to introduce raw data assets, billions of records from cities into these vehicles. And we're having conversations with auto manufacturers to say the car can know where the stop sign is without having to observe it first. Uh, also encouraging car sharing, who, who are aggressively moving into the autonomous and connected vehicle space, want to be very conscious about curb infrastructure, and that's something the director of the Department of Transportation mentioned earlier today, and thinking about where it is safe to unload and load passengers. When the Nationals Ballpark was built, we didn't really think about car sharing, and cars were pulling over on the side of the highway there to drop people off. So thinking about how um, just simple raw data assets, not even crazy predictive statistics can be used to help kind of inform how these autonomous vehicles move across the space. And I will say from the other side, from the car manufacturer's perspective, they're really eager because they need a government relations strategy to say, we're going to be careful. We're going to know that these cars improve safety. Um, and we're, we're going to promise that we're only going to park in safe spaces. VIA is a very big advocate of that here in the district. Um, and so it actually works from both sides where there's pull uh, and desire to do this mutual thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the. What I find in the, a lot of the autonomous conversation is that we quickly jump to the whole world is autonomous. Yeah. And how does it all work that way? And mm. right now, what we've learned over these years of understanding how humans drive with humans is understanding those algorithms. Now we're going to have how humans understand working with the latest GM vehicle on Super Cruise. And how does that work? And then there's going to be the, the autonomous vehicles that are happening as well. So the, the notion that we're going to jump right to utopia, to me, the, one of the biggest opportunities are opportunities for us all to work together. And one of the biggest technical challenges is how do we start to figure out how that works collectively? Right now, when I come up to a four-way stop sign, I kind of look over and I see Carrie Ann and I see that like I was kind of there first, but she might be going first. And she looks like she's in a hurry, so I'm going to let you go. But um, when you do that Thank with you. the vehicle, it's like, how is, how is that going to happen? Is it going to be that the, the Swedish vehicles are usually kind of, I don't know, they're, they're calmer and I can go in front of them, but the German ones I better watch out for. <laughs> right? all, all of these algorithms we think are going to really come into play so that, that when I look at ARITY algorithms in the future, they're going to be things that the, the Volvo S80 does not play nicely with certain GM Silverados, but only in rainy conditions. It, mm -hmm. It's all of that understanding and that complication that I think we fast forward beyond and think through the, uh, the, the zero crash thing is, is fantastic. We know the vehicles will be more safe. We know there'll be less fatalities, but to think there's not going to still be crashes with all this complications with infrastructure and the technology and the vehicles and humans, 
there's just a, a, a much, bigger, um, much bigger world that's going to happen with autonomy than just what is it going to look like when they all drive themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. I have another question or two for our panel, but I did want to let you guys know that we will have time for a couple of questions. So if you guys can start thinking of them now and shortening them as much as possible, <laughs> we'll come to you in a second. So we spent a lot of time thinking about cities, especially large cities. I'm wondering how you guys are thinking about the scalability of some of these solutions for smaller towns and for rural areas where Americans still live and still need a little help when it comes to transportation, mobility, issues such as that. Derek, you want to start? Yeah, so I think what's really interesting is uh, prior to what we were trying to do, a lot of people figured that for at least for, for bike share to work, it only works in the big cities. But um, the reality is that we are in many small small towns, as you have described, for example, we're in Miami Lakes, a town of like 50,000 people. And what you see is that people use it. It's, I think with a lot of things about transportation, there's this basic need to move people around. And it's really about finding the right solution at the right cost structure and adapting it to uh, each and individual each individual city. And uh, that's what we have been, been doing as we, as we kind of expand throughout the country. Um, how we run our operations, how we engage the, the government in, in DC is very different from how we do it in a, in a much smaller city of like 50,000 people. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's one of the, the, the benefits to having kind of like the, the raw product in, in our sense being very flexible and it's really about tailoring it to each and every uh, city around the country. Yeah, here you are. I work in cities, so I'm gonna say pass. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a believer that when that most of these solutions were for the larger cities. And I started to think about the two things. One, the, the level of fatalities that happen on uncontrolled intersections in rural areas, it, it's a really big problem, and those are really catastrophic accidents, not the fender benders that happen inside of the city. So I think the safety solutions have a, have a role to play in small towns. And the other side is, as the, the, um, the baby boomers get older, people want to stay in their homes. One of the biggest things you need to do is get to the market and you need to get to the doctor's office and you shouldn't be driving anymore because you're 85 years old in rural places. So the idea that there's not going to be these fleets of, of vehicles that can help take people from, from A to B and probably in a very efficient manner because no one's on the schedule at that point. So I, I think the, uh, the, the role of autonomy in in smaller towns might actually, it, it could happen almost faster than some of the things in the cities just because the, the need is there and it's a little bit less complicated. Right. Do we have any audience questions? All right, great. I have a question that I actually want to finish up with. So I started off asking what the biggest challenge you guys think cities are facing might be. I'm wondering when you guys look out at cities 10 years from now, what is the thing that's going to be most different? To, to me, it's coordination. It's coordination amongst uh, all the different jurisdictions and the coordination amongst the, uh, with the car manufacturers, with the utilities to get vehicles charged. I, I think it has to be a much tighter ecosystem in order for, for us to get where we want it to go. And, and ultimately, the consumers want this to happen. Consumers want shared mobility options. They want the autonomous vehicles. They want more freedom and lower costs. So I think that drive is going to force the, the cities, the utilities, uh, transit organizations, everyone to work together more. Mm -hmm. I would say millennial entrepreneurs who are socially mindful, particularly women, given that I am a woman-owned business, um, are going to eat the big businesses' lunch money, and they don't see it coming. And that's fantastic as an opportunity for me personally, but I think you're going to see a lot more um, thoughtfully user research, user designed, focused transportation solutions that um, are currently in my brain and the geniuses of the millennial generation. I think from, from my perspective, it's uh, the, the role of uh, the city government, how it's uh, evolving. So we have seen um, in cities like uh, San Francisco, Seattle, even Vancouver, putting out all these new mobility playbooks, which uh, talk about how they would integrate um, these new companies and use these new f uh, modes of transportation into the existing infrastructure and allowing them to really operate in a regulated manner, but also in a manner that allows them to, to showcase their innovation um, to the population. And, and this is a trend that we're kind of seeing as we engage more cities, and, and more cities are, are really approaching new mobility from, from a more systematic standpoint. And I think that's really one aspect that will really accelerate uh, the transformation of uh, transportation in, in cities. Everyone, please join me in thanking our panel.